there is procedure put in place that Jomo Kenyatta are more stringent, S more inspections, more personnel. So you are likely to get caught. The same would not apply if you are coming through Eldoret Airport. Part of the reason for this scarcity is down to a lack of resources. The question is really a question about how to, how to resource it. It has to be paid for by government. Uh, government budgets are stretched a lot, and especially in the last three years following, uh, following the drought. I mean, first of all, following the post-election violence, and you had to invest resources in a lot of humanitarian assistance, and then with the, with the drought. And it just comes to a question of numbers. You have to balance uh, the requirements of all these agencies in Treasury, and not everybody gets the amount of money that they would like. To find an even bigger weak spot for those willing to take the risks involved, head east to the other big hole in the surveillance net, Kenya's long, porous and lawless border with Somalia. One of it is vast. The personnel are uh, quite spaced. They are far apart. So, uh, it is easy for somebody to smuggle counterfeit goods from Somalia. It is also easy, for example, if a cargo plane with counterfeit goods land in Wajir, it is very easy for that, those goods to be transported either towards Garissa or Nairobi and sold in our shops. So Somalia is a big problem. A report by the UN Monitoring Group on Somalia and Eritrea released in August 2010 indicated that there was a thriving cross-border trade that took place along border towns like Wajir and Mandera in the smuggling of basic household commodities like sugar. The business cycle is a simple one. Charcoal exports come in from Somalia, which then fund sugar exports, most of which come in to Kenya through the port of Kismayo. According to the United Nations, bank accounts in the Gulf states like Dubai, Qatar and Saudi Arabia handle the transactions of the trade, pointing to the link between covert smuggling on one hand and organized crime groups on the other. Custom officials based in northeastern Kenya estimate that about 500 tons of contraband sugar gets into the country this way on almost a daily basis. And those exact same links can be used to move other goods as well, from household detergents to milk powder to light arms. China is another critical element in the counterfeit industry in Kenya today, both as a source of goods and some of the labor to sell it locally. We have to admit that there are genuine goods that come from China genuine product but there are a lot of counterfeit goods that come from china so the persons some of the people we have arrested almost in all cases in all cases the people we have taken to court they always in the course of investigations we come to establish that these goods were imported from china but here's the thing even though the problem is clearly known efforts to address it are haphazard slow and quite disjointed Despite China being a key source of counterfeit goods, for example, the government has been quite slow in laying down and implementing the policy framework needed to deal with these problems. In 2005, for example, the government of China and Kenya signed a memorandum of understanding to cut the influx of substandard goods into the country. That memorandum, however, only came into force seven years later when the Standards Bureau here signed a contract with the China Certification and Inspections Group in February 2012 to test goods headed for the Kenyan market to establish if they are genuine or not before they're shipped. As part of efforts to deal with the problem of scarce resources, Section 22 of the anti counterfeit Act created what are known as designated inspectors. In other words, officials of other government agencies like the police force or KRA agents who can provide surveillance in places where ACA personnel are not present. In a small way, we are getting a lot of cooperation from certain policemen especially individual policemen, who inform us of uh, uh, places where counterfeiting is being carried out. It is not structured, but uh, we do get information once in a while, and that has helped us because we've carried out uh, successful raids. But this is a small percentage, I mean a small percentage of policemen who volunteer information. Since all policemen are uh, designated inspectors, and if all of them were to work in sync with us, then it would be different. The character of government agents that they all have independent sovereign control of their of their mandate. So to be able to have to collaborate with others requires a lot more conversations and relationships. A similar argument could be leveled at state policy, which you could describe as being too timid. 
In August 2011, a Communications Commission directive ordered mobile service providers to shut down all counterfeit handsets. That directive would have affected an estimated 3 million Kenyans and it was due to come into force in September. September of that year, however, came and went. And on the 21st of December 2011, CCK's Acting Director General Francis Ongusi gave Kenyan consumers another reprieve, announcing a four-month extension to the deadline to the 30th of April 2012. At the time, he argued that consumer education was needed and mobile service providers needed more time to set up a database and a mechanism for shutting off the millions of fake handsets active in Kenya. In this instance, the unsteady policy direction set by the Communications Commission of Kenya, similar to that seen in implementing a directive to have SIM cards registered, for example, has done little to inspire any respect for the implementation of the law in Kenya. And as far as resources go, industry players argue that there's enough to go around. Resource deployment is where the problem is.